Hey everyone, so I've got a very special episode of The Daily Wave for you today. It's my first guest episode on the channel. I know that I've said previously that I wouldn't do guest episodes on the channel, but I feel like uh, this person is worth breaking that rule for, and who I had on was Kobe, actually. All of you will probably know Kobe from Twitter. He's very famous in the industry, uh, and it was just a great conversation. We talked about a lot of different things in the kind of like wake of the terror fallout, talked about things like, you know, Ponzi's in crypto, you know, v bad VCs, uh, kind of like uh, having our most spiciest takes it kind of like put out there publicly and a bunch of different things so uh, please do enjoy the episode it was really fun it goes for about an hour and uh, let me know if you enjoyed it in the uh, in the comments section or on the discord channel thanks everyone all right hey everyone uh so it's something a bit different for daily way of viewers today or listeners as well today i've got kobe with me now kobe obviously doesn't need any introduction uh he's very famous on on crypto twitter he's been around for a long time and kind of like he hit me up uh on tw on twitter on dms after i put out my tweet saying you know i wish i had an anon kind of like alt because there's a lot of things i want to say but i can't say due to things like reputational risk right and kind of like we got to chatting and we're like you know let's record something uh, in the wake of like the terror fallout let's kind of like just get on record something and talk about like all the shady i guess stuff that happens in this industry and kind of like everything that goes with that so that's what we're going to do today uh we're just going to talk there's no real agenda we're just going to like talk about kind of like what's on our, on our mind but yeah thanks kobe for for joining me for this i think this is going to be this is going to be good i thought i was just going to bait you into saying all the things that you get reputation risk for i thought that was the plan <laughs> you're probably <laughs> you're totally yeah, you probably, me. <laughs> yeah you might get it out of me to be honest i mean uh, i can be pre pre <laughs> pretty honest if someone's baiting me for it <laughs> <laughs> when you say reputation risk what is it specifically that you worry about because i know that like um there were emails sent from particular people i don't know specifically who but like uh, the insinuation was big fund and I've seen screenshots, but I don't know if the screenshots are real and they did blur out the names, basically telling people um, where they should land on the UST issue in public. Mm -hmm. Do you mean like if you go against like the powers that be, you are then unable to participate in things that are interesting and exciting in the future, whether it's like fundraising rounds or, um, you know, uh, conferences or parties or or whatever or like even like they don't they're unwilling to create content with you or something i mean there's there's an element of that and i think it's probably less less that just because i mean i think some people would consider me to be a power that be right just because like i have a large following and i'm, I'm pretty involved with the ecosystem but i, I think okay, it's don't more brag, so don't brag come on no no <laughs> then you flex on me <laughs> <laughs> i mean you, you're you're much bigger than i am but i think i, I think what it is really and what the what the core of it is is that like it's kind of like a funny thing in this industry where depending on what you do or depending on kind of like what you say um you know word gets around really quickly and you kind of like earn a certain reputation right and and for myself i think kind of like my reputation uh, at the moment is, is is pretty good i'm just known as kind of like this eth maxi who talks about the merge a lot right um not really known for kind of like doing any, any anything shady or kind of like trying to to dump bags on people or anything like that right um and then uh, yeah, it's kind of like just, a, it's definitely a weird thing. There's a lot of like first and second order effects to it. And I, I, I don't want to kind of like make enemies. That's that's number one thing, right? Like with the terror thing, I wanted to call out terror so many times publicly. Like I didn't really call it out. Like I would I would mention it to people when they asked me about it. I would say, guys, look, this is like not going to work long term. Like this is so obviously not going to work. Um, and I talked to like close friends about it, but I would never call it out publicly like the bankless guys did because you saw what happened to the bankless guys. Like ruthlessly attacked by these kind of like lunar moon boys over and not just them like do Kwan, right obviously was was in the trenches with them kind of like doing the same stuff and it's it's kind of like mentally draining to do that so it's kind of like negative ev to call these things out publicly and then also the a lot of the people involved with terra were legitimate kind of like vcs and big names in this industry right and so they'll probably get to talking and be like you know these guys are like you know uh, going against kind of like terra they're saying all this stuff and and kind of like you lose some sort of reputation out of that now whether you care about that or not is a different different kind of like matter but i think it, yeah it, there's a lot of kind of like backroom chatter that goes on right and there's a lot of kind of like uh i mean it's like in the industry there's a lot of like inside baseball that goes on and you kind of like don't want to be on the wrong side of that as you see you you, you put it perfectly once on twitter where you said you don't want to be the main character of crypto twitter ever <laughs> right because if you're the main character they'll they'll kill you off um you want to be kind of like the comedic relief and i think 
that's kind of how I try to position myself on Twitter. Uh, I'm, I am serious sometimes, but I, I do a lot of shit posting. And I think you may fall into the same category with that. Cause yeah, you don't want to be the target of all of that. It's just, it's, it's not fun. Right. Yeah. I think like, especially because they're financial products, right? So you can, you can take an opinion on something. And if the opinion, like if you have extremely high conviction in the opinion, then I think you can be compelled to share it, even if it's unpopular. Um, you know, I wrote the thing about ApeCoin staking because I really believe that that is uh, co-opting a like industry term for something, turning it into something else, which is just bad for um, uh, the people that like fall for it. Mm -hmm. With Luna, um, you know, you can have a, like a private analysis. You can think it's going to um, UST will collapse. I, I think what I believed was that like. In, in Luna's original pre-Bitcoin reserves form, um, it was likely to collapse at some point, but you just don't know when that is. It could be now, it could be in three years, it could be in five, so you don't know. Um, and then when they started collateralizing it with Bitcoin, I thought the game seemed to be... I thought they'd like revealed what the plan was all along, which was, um, you know, build a layer one blockchain which has value, um, has an ecosystem, raise a bunch of money and over collateralize UST, um, which maybe could have actually worked if they'd maybe started earlier or if market conditions had been different or you know maybe just in a, in a different um, parallel universe that they could have pulled that off. Um, but because it's a financial instrument and because you, you if you have um, like a bunch of followers, being like short this stuff now, short it, this is going to zero, this is going to break, I, I think also can just create bad outcomes um, as well. And I, I, I didn't have the conviction to, to know, you know, this is definitely going to collapse in the next um, however long. Mm -hmm. And also you become desensitized to it over time as well. So like you, you look at how it works, you go, mm, that doesn't seem sound, that feels like it could collapse. And then it goes through like harsh market conditions like May last year um, and it does survive it and the peg is returned and you see all these people, like these huge funds who you assume are smarter than you um, bidding it and working on the ecosystem. So you just kind of go, eh, well, I must be missing something. I'll leave that, you know, alone where it is. Um, you know, who, who knows what happens next. Um, so I, I just think there's like stuff where you have really high conviction and you just, it seems obviously bad. You should talk about it. And then in the stuff in this like middle area, you probably should talk about it because it can help people out. And, um, but it's clear why um, people don't. And I, you know, know why I didn't, I would have been talking about it collapsing way too early and then mm -hmm. like bought the top going, clearly I'm wrong for some reason. Fuck it. I'm, I'm <laughs> buying in now. Um, but like a big respect to the people that were willing to put themselves out there on an ongoing basis um, uh, against all the, you know, um, attacks from uh, community members and stuff. Um, they like, like they were just writing their analysis and they were right. Um, they were writing it in public and dealing with a bunch of shit like the Freddie and Anon guy and um, everyone else. So yeah, I do understand why it, it, it is like other assets throughout history where you just, there's no point really talking about them because you can't really add anything novel. Like people have done the analysis. It's like mm -hmm. you're, you, you can't really say anything. You might be wrong. And saying something just invites so much um, stress and drama um, and like abuse into your life. And it's just really not, um, not worth it. But then something like this happens and you go, yeah, shit, maybe I should have spent some more time writing something greatly in depth about how this mechanic works and the success cases and the failure cases for it and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's only mm -hmm. so much time. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think like there's a lot that goes into kind of like pointing out things that you think are going to collapse and then they don't, right? Look, look at the Tether truthers as they're known. They've been talking about Tether collapsing for like since day one, basically, uh, right? And about how shady it is, how no one can redeem, how there's going to be a bank run. And it still hasn't happened to this day. And it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And I mean, Tether just posted their kind of like new reserves report yesterday. 
uh, it seems okay. People will harp on about certain things, but it, it seems like it's okay. So people, I think, looked at that as well when it came to UST. And they're like, you know, look at all these people that were wrong for all these years on, t on Tether. I'm not going to speak up about UST because like, what if I'm wrong? Then I'm just known as this crazy conspiracy nut in the corner. And like people will kind of like attack me for it, so, so to speak. And you mentioned like the funds and the VCs that are involved in this stuff. I mean, they and lended a lot of legitimacy to this project. And, and you're right. There's a lot of people out there who think that these people that like a VCs and funds are smarter than them when in reality a lot of the time they're not right they just have the money it's not necessarily necessary for them to have the intelligence like especially in the market we've seen over the last two to three years where there was so much money flowing you know that, that it was easy to raise a fund right and then you just put money into anything really and it would pump right for for, for the longest time but and then people, you know, especially retail investors will see that and just jump into it. They'll be like, well, if these guys are saying that this is a good thing, they must have done their research. You know, as you said, this is this must be good. And all these people who are saying it's going to collapse, these are like evil people and they just don't want me to, to make money. And especially when it came to Ethereum people, people were just like, oh, they're just ETH maxis. They don't want Terra to succeed because it's like a threat to their bags. And I think th that's come a lot from the Bitcoin account because like it actually, I think, was true for, for BTC maxis and probably still is. Like they, they spread a lot of kind of like just wrong information about Ethereum. And it definitely is like a bit of a bag thing for them. So I think people just like take that and are kind of like, well, I mean, it is for ETH Maxis too. Like I'm not trying to like in other ecosystems, like ETH Maxis coping over Solana, for example. I mean, that's definitely kind of like, oh, we feel a threat to our bags. But like, because I know that and because I'm conscious of that, I, I can see it from the other side too. I can see it from Terra people seeing, you know, the ETH Maxis as these evil people who just want to destroy our ecosystem. And then obviously the conspiracy start where it's like, oh, it was attacked. UST was attacked. It was like this grand conspiracy that uh, it was going to kind of like, uh, they did this to kind of like destroy our ecosystem, um, which, you yeah, I mean, the way it played out, to be honest, I didn't think it would happen that fast. Like within three days, it went to like zero. And like, I don't think we've ever actually seen a blockchain properly die and get like halted and like just completely destroyed like that ever before. Um, and, and it was just kind of like wild that that played out so quickly. But there's still a lot of people who are like, oh, you know, let's fork, you know, let's get Terra Classic, uh, te you know, let's put the other one as Terra Classic. Let's get a new Terra 2.0. And I think a lot of that's got to do with people lost money and they just want to like get a free airdrop, right? And kind of like sell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so much to kind of like unpack with all of that. But I, I think what I would call out more, I guess, if I was an anon, I'd call out the specific people uh, that were kind of like doing this. And I'd call them out a lot more aggressively than, than, I, than I normally would, just because I feel like no, there's never any accountability in this ecosystem for the people who shield like just garbage. And it wasn't just uh, like terror that they shield. And to be fair, I don't really consider that terror was like built in bad faith so to speak or kind of like garbage i think do kwan's ego got ahead of itself because of the fact that it grew so quickly and he had like a, a loyal following behind him and he kind of like probably had a god com complex from that but i think in general there are a lot of honest builders in that ecosystem uh but there's a lot of other things that just kind of like aren't honest and uh, literally like these vcs and funds they're literally pump and dumping on you it's not a meme like they, they they kind of like pump it up i mean look at the solana ecosystem tokens like it was the same vcs in every round high fully diluted kind of like value right and then ftx will list the perps and they're just short the perp and then cover it with their vested tokens like people are like oh they're still vesting they haven't yeah. sold like you know what i mean like and that's the kind of stuff that i'd probably be more aggressive on um but i i, I think that yeah I, as i said like I, I just don't feel comfortable doing it from like my doxed account so you know so to speak yeah like i think the solana ecosystem i i think in summary you i started writing it writing something about this it's like a lot of the VCs, they've come for the regulatory arbitrage and the mm -hmm. like early public markets rather than like any high conviction belief in um, like crypto or transparent financial systems or whatever. And they originally, if you go way back when, the original crypto funds, um, including some that these days have, you know, really lowered their quality of their thinking or their, their standards, I guess. But originally you had these like high conviction, directionally correct people who had to have a thesis that stood up to a lot of criticism because the space was um, dodgy. It was like Silk Road money, um, <laughs> like coins and... The Ethereum ICO were like ICOs were weird. Ethereum was weird. Um, you know, like you paid for Ethereum and then nothing happened for like a year or something uh, from mm -hmm. that from the ICO. Um, and some people never even got their coins. Like I know a guy who put like 0.1 of a Bitcoin into um, uh, the Ethereum ICO and they got a wallet and it was empty. And then he like <laughs> asked for help and they just <laughs> never helped him. Uh, <laughs> um, 
and so like you know it was like weird dodgy stuff at the in those days but they had some there were funds who went i think these things are going to be important to the world for these reasons um and you had to believe that quite deeply in order to make that bet with your own money or you had to stand up to a lot of criticism in order to raise money from lps to to make those bets um and it over time it seems like those like those vcs have either completely degraded their quality of thinking like started drinking the Kool-Aid or whatever the the term is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or we've been repopulated by um vc outfits who are just coming because like the markets are dumb there's high liquidity for um there's high liquidity public markets on a very 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 far end of a risk um uh sort of scale um and because the sec has kind of sponsored this anti-retail model of prioritizing uh, allowing private raises um from accredited investors and professional investors um and enforcing against icos because i i know icos were all like mostly bad because 99.9 percent .9 of the products failed and it was a fundraising tactic for um felonious individuals but as a model for retail investors, if the product is good, it's much fairer than what we have today, which is, you know, these low float, high FDV models. And in the short sightedness or like, it sort of feels like they have an erection for the like guaranteed gains. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So like mm -hmm. the Solana VC ecosystem have funded several like no product or no user, no metric, um, uh tokens mm -hmm. that are worth multi-billions they just go down no retail user wins the products don't launch or if they do launch no one uses them and i think they've set back the ecosystem for like the DeFi re uh, retail ecosystem in solana by a few years because they've done that because people see these products now and go that i'm not touching that um mm -hmm. either the chart makes them think something might be wrong with that product if you look at the chart and the charts only down they go is this safe mm -hmm. um or they just think anything in the solana ecosystem is like apart from the nfts maybe they have quite a booming nft ecosystem now but apart from the nfts it might be a scam because um the, this model has played out and then you had the luna vc ecosystem um where I guess people just assumed the perpetual motion machine had been created and it just happened to be on the blockchain, right? Like we've mm -hmm. discovered um, this infinite source of money and it just happens, the, the missing piece was the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and in response to like critical um, pieces about uh, like how this might play out, people would just get called poor or they would get called names or they'll get dunked on, or they would say, nah, jump will prop it up, you know, mm -hmm. jump will, and maybe jump did prop it up a few times, you, who knows? Um, but it, think, it feels like the critical thinking has been significantly reduced, um, perhaps because there's so much stupidity already. So it's just like, mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter. You can just <laughs> fund whatever. Um, and people's short term focus has really, really, really increased um people are very happy to fund something and then short the perps straight away um i think the flip side of this or the good side is you do get to see a lot of uh, much better active vcs who like don't do these kind of things like uh, i'm not going to name names because i don't want to simp for uh, vcs and they might do something weird in the future and then i'll be on camera saying like great and they just might turn out to be all the same but i know there are a couple of funds who raised funds in 2019 ish and they haven't sold anything um they might just suck <laughs> like they should have sold <laughs> yeah. shit. but like like they haven't sold anything they're waiting they're, they're on a 10 year or whatever um horizon um i think people give a16z shit for not being crypto native and you know i i, I don't know if you saw the other day but chris dixon who's one of the gps there was like shitting on polynia um, yeah, saying but, he was yeah. like non-technical or something so maybe they're not very crypto native but one thing that's good about them is they just diamond hand everything with a 10 year odd horizon mm -hmm. i don't think they sell very much either i'm not a huge fan of them as a fund and i don't think i would recommend them 
to founders. Uh, I think you should go with someone much more crypto native. Um, and maybe they'll become more crypto native in time. But one good thing about them is they don't treat the crypto markets like a hedge fund does. They don't mm -hmm. go, how do we hedge our bags? Right, We've put a $100 million investment here. So we need a short perps or short Bitcoin or short ETH comparatively to make ourselves neutral at all time and like win in every single situation. They do take on the risk and... Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a huge risk because it's other people's money and they're buying massively discounted prices. But, um, you know, at least they're not um, dumping on everyone the same day that they're buying. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the other crypto native big names that um, uh, have not gone so profit maxi, they do still at least try and fund things that are successful or going to work um, in order to, to make money. And it's still a bit of a rigged game, rigged for VCs because of the SEC's rules. But... Um, so I think that's the flip side. Like the, the a lot of these really like low tier VCs, I think it's unlikely that in the future they will be able to get the same um, uh, like allocations and inclusion in rounds because people can just see how they behave. They can see times um, get difficult and the chart just goes straight line downwards. And then your project struggles, your community like starts fighting the developers and um, Blah, 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 blah. So I think people will want much more longer term ecosystem type partners. So I think that might be the, the good side of these, these things, like the, those actors just gradually get washed out. But maybe I've been too optimistic. No, I mean, I think you're right. And I think I, I could, I, I can know which one, which of the VCs you're talking about. Um, but I would actually, I mean, I think it's, it's a good thing that we still have those in the ecosystem, but I would argue that some of them are just being dragged into the low tier stuff just forcibly um, at some kind of like point, like, like the highest tier of VCs, like they raise these massive funds, but then their LPs are going to be like, why aren't you funding this? Or why aren't you funding this? This looks cool. This goes, mm -hmm. and then they kind of like get forced into it just because like a lot of the other funds and VCs are doing it and they want to obviously keep the capital in their own fund. So they might invest in something that they probably don't have as much conviction on as, as something, you know, it's something that they would, if they were you know, re retained kind of like their high tier kind of like uh, VC status, so to speak. But I, I think you're just, just saying in democracy sucks. <laughs> I mean, it does suck. Well, it's the, the least sucky system, right? As they say, but no, I, I think that, um, like, yeah, they do get forced into it, but uh, there are yeah, definitely um, some of them still out there that really care. But still, the game is definitely still rigged. I mean, as you said, they get discounted tokens. They get discounted allocations. They're there from basically day zero. But the thing is, people will, will argue and say, you know, oh, look, they all get they get preferential treatment. They're insiders. And it's like, oh, look, guys, we did the same thing with ICOs for the public. And look how that turned out. Um, it wasn't even kind of like... Uh, I guess like it wasn't even um, a good thing. Like it actually was worse than probably what we have now, right? In terms of like how many people got screwed buying these kind of like sorts of things. So I think, you know, when you kind of like look at it from that perspective and kind of like take all that in, into account as well, there's no good solution to, to these sorts of things. Like the, the everyone tries to kind of like bring up their own solutions. Say, oh, if it was available to the public it would have been different. But I, I don't really think so. I mean, there are other tokens that have been available to the public that just like they do liquidity mining, they get farmed by these same kind of like funds, right? Like and, and just dumped anyway. Like the funds will, will find a way into it regardless of kind of like where they have to, to enter. So yeah, and I, and I think kind of like on, on that note as well, like the low tier ones, the reason why they keep doing it is because it keeps working. Like it's, it's if they can keep making money on it, then they're going to keep doing it. And that's another thing as I was talking about, like with regards to accountability, no one really cares or holds them accountable over the, the long term. It's kind of like a short term exposure. Like, you know, Zach XBT on Twitter does like an amazing job exposing all of this. But like, does anyone remember after like a day? No, like everyone just forgets about it. Right. And there's no recourse, no, no kind of like accountability. These these a lot of these funds still get entrance into these into these projects, which may just be shit tier projects to begin with. And it's all just like a, a kind of like a, a retail money fleece at the end of the day, which a lot of projects are. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of that going on, but yeah, I, I don't have a solution to it, unfortunately. And I don't think that the crypto ecosystem has a collective memory of longer than like an hour, uh, because it just seems like we, f we forget about something, you know, even if it's the most scandalous thing ever. I mean, no one's talking about the terror stuff anymore. And it just happened last week. It's the biggest event, probably one of the biggest events in crypto history, and no one talks about it at, anymore. And, and it's kind of like, it's kind of sad, right? Um, yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Th I, I mean, I hope that... Um it will disseminate through founders, I guess. Like, you know, a lot of 
founders want um, other founders on their cap table, and they often go to those people kind of earlier on um, to get the lowdown on funds. So I think it will hopefully disseminate through. I know there's a few people that I'll like refuse to co-invest with now. Mm -hmm. I don't do like a ton of venture stuff. Um, like I haven't in the past, I've done bits and pieces and I'm not doing tons at the moment either. Um, but I, I will, there's a few people I will refuse to like co-invest with because I just know that if they have a decent enough chunk, it's like a bloodbath or it's like mercenary game. And I like it, the project sort of struggles from day one or it, it gets set back at least a bunch. Um, and I know that like what advice I would give to founders if people hit me up and said, who um, should I go with? Um, but at the same time, we've gone from a very founder friendly environment to a very, to investors having all the power again. Um, in the last sort of six months. So um, yeah, for a while. I, at the top of the bull market, you did see a lot of things start doing like ICOs again and just saying like, fuck, um, <laughs> like the sort of populist attitude to uh, VCs. And um, I, I do think that model is so much better. Um, and I think a lot of this blame, like the VC problem, I think is a symptom of the SEC because mm -hmm. if you're a founder, and you are building for the next 10, 15, 20 years, something that you deeply care about and is very important to you to, um, to, to build your vision and realize that vision in reality. You don't want to do an ICO unless you're anonymous and you're happy with your OPSEC, um, et cetera, because you don't want to incur that additional regulatory risk for your baby for, for building the thing that you, you know, really want to um, care about. So you get a legal advisor or a regulatory advisor or whatever, and you figure out the safest possible way to get funding to build the thing that you want to build. And they will always tell you, go with the credit investors, uh, treat it as though it is a security when you're selling your SAFT or your SAFE or your equity or your tokens or whatever you're doing, a uh, straight token sale. Just imagine they are uh, securities and comply with security laws on, uh, like professional investors only um and uh at some point in the future through like decentralization through whatever um other people like contributing to it potentially then it becomes not a security and you can have public markets um but if you're a founder that's the model you get pushed to go down because it's the least risky for you actually building the thing that you want to build um which means retail is left on the sidelines. It means you can only raise money from these, um, like these venture capitalists who have been set up almost with the purpose of funding these things and then trying to sell it when public markets come available. Um, and, and what I find difficult about it is that there is some stuff which is so obviously a scam. It's just a, a scam token. And then there's stuff which is very, 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 like obviously a legitimate project with people trying to build uh, honestly and earnestly. But then there might be that, you know, it's an honest project, but they've got something wrong. So it's just going to be a failure, but they're all trying their best, but they've made some mistakes and they believe the wrong thing. And then there's like things where, well, it might work. It might not work. We actually don't care. All we care about is like blending in the middle area so that we get, tokens vested and we can sell something. It doesn't matter if the product works or not. Um, and there's this big spectrum of like from outright scam to like golden, like non-financial project, like Bitcoin, right? Like you can't say that Satoshi created Bitcoin for personal profit because he's or she's never um, uh, sold anything as far as we know. And they've probably died, um, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then you have Ethereum, which is like similar to Bitcoin, but they... They kept some um, allocation for themselves and they did do an ICO for fundraising. Um, so they pre-mined 70% or whatever the Bitcoin maxis talk about. And then <laughs> they sold it all for like $0.04 or something. Mm. Um, and, and those things, like they, I think it's difficult to say that these things are not legitimate projects that are trying to build something important in the world. Then you get to like Uniswap and I feel similar there, right? Like clearly they're actually trying to build a legitimate project, um, the token model might suck. They might not accrue value the same way Ethereum can accrue value. Um, it might be a bad investment. I don't know. Um, but it, it's definitely not a scam. Mm -hmm. And then you can keep going and you end up with stuff that's like, all right, I can't tell if this is fraud. I can't tell if this is a legitimate project that's just going to fail. I don't know how much they, you know, um, they know about like 
if this is like economically viable. And I think that middle area, that obfuscated, um, unclear what's actually happening here area is the most dangerous because out of that, you get some home run winners. You get like something comes out of it, looks a bit shady, looks a bit dodgy, and it turns out to be a great project with great people. Um, and they've solved something you didn't think they could solve. But on the other hand, you have things that just go straight to like, okay, that was basically a scam type, um, Mm -hmm. type side. Um, and I, I think that's where the SEC should be actually adding um, value to um, crypto ecosystem um, instead of just enforcing against like people raising funds. Yeah, so I, I do think that like the SEC just enforcing against um, it really what they've done in the past is that enforced against like fraud, right? So there was a lot of ICOs that were just telling lies about what their product was or what their product was backed by or, or whatever. Um, like the diamonds one or the, there was one about weed. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> and then they try to take down big stuff like BitConnect and they're trying to take down Ripple. It's not even clear that they will succeed um, mm-hmm. in, um, in the action against Ripple. Um, and meanwhile, everything else is left in a state of uncertainty um, and retail investors are actually losing um, because the SEC seems unwilling to force people to do basic stuff like disclosures. Like if you think about the big problems that have happened in crypto, like UST, um, Anchor, uh, the wormhole um, Mm -hmm. uh, exploit, Ronin Bridge exploit um, recently, um, Bitfinex hack, Mt. Gox hack, token rug pulls, bad investments, uh, down only like perps type things. Stuff where investors actually get harmed because these things are kind of complicated if you're new. It feels like the right remedy is to address them directly. So with BitConnect and um, UST and um, these kind of projects, you the SEC should just require these projects to clearly state where the yield comes from. Mm-hmm. So for um, UST, it's like we invent it as a growth mechanism. It's, you know, it's printed. Um, it's a growth mechanism in order to attract people to our ecosystem. Um, you know, it's not backed by anything. These like USTs are just created out of nowhere. Um, and then some people might go, hmm, that sounds confusing. How does that work? And they might read more about the thing. And for BitConnect, the... Um, I can't remember where the lending yield came from. You got paid in more BitConnect, I think. So maybe they were just printing um, more BitConnect as well. Um, for HEX, it is like token inflation, right? It's equity inflation. So you get paid in more, um, you get paid with uh, future emissions of the, the native instrument. For ApeCoin staking, you get paid with DAO treasury emissions. So the, the supply is capped, but... Um, they just pay you out of the treasury for for staking. So that's where the yield comes from. Eventually that will run out. um, So the the yield is unsustainable. Um, But just having disclosures as to where it comes from allows you to realize that some things like UST inventing new dollars is very different to uh, an R of lending rate, which is a borrower paying the lender um, because they want to they would think they can make more money in the short term right so it's um someone pays a, a rate and probably have like sometimes juices it with some token emissions as well um and and but having like clarity around those things i think protects way more retail investments retail investors than this um enforcement action which is after the fact and after everyone has already lost because people would be able to read these things and make more informed decisions. Another thing is um, the Solana ecosystem you spoke about, these down only perps where things open at a $50 billion fully diluted valuation and they have a four year vesting schedule and the chart just goes down forever. Um, what could help here is a, a uniform and clear uh, emission schedule graph on a per asset basis. So if you, um, I think oxygen, oxy is one of the ones that went like just straight down. Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about buying oxy, 
you want to look at the price, you want to look at the market cap, but then you also want to know um, what is happening to the supply over the next three years. Because uh, if the supply is tripling over the next year, you need to go, is the demand going to triple to um, to even just sustain the, the price? Um, and then you should probably have token projects um, disclosing all private investment terms um, because they're public markets, right? So like if uh, ApeCoin did a DAO treasury sale um, at a discount with some vesting lockup, all of the terms of that I think should be public because otherwise retail investors are, there's information asymmetry. They can't um, uh, make informed decisions about uh, what even happens when these coins unlock because they don't know what their cost basis is. They don't know if these people are at break even, massively above water, massively underwater. Um, they don't know, even know, necessarily know who is buying. So if you're uh, lucky enough to be one of these VCs who gets a massively discounted um, round, um, and then one of your other investments blows up, like you know, you you saw Hashed lost three point five billion dollars in Luna. I think it's useful to, for retail investors to know where else Hashed has um, locked exposure. Um, otherwise, there's massive information asymmetry there, and I think you can tick off on a like a case by case basis. Um, what are the practical risks, and how are people getting hurt, and how can you? inform um, the public better with extremely light touch things um, that also help people identify fraud because if people are not complying with um, where does the yield come from, you at least go, why are they not telling me? Um, and I think that, that if the SEC took this like light touch um, regulatory path, more investors would be actually protected than them just like, like post death enforcing against Luna or post death enforcing against um, BitConnect or or whoever. And sure, they can still enforce against fraud. Like I think that they should. Um, they can enforce against bad actors and blah blah blah. But if they want to keep innovation on shore and they actually want to protect retail investment, retail investors who are going to do crypto stuff anyway, they're going to do it. Um, these light touches just seem like net positive for everyone. It's like a tiny bit of work for a project to do. Um, makes things so much more uh, clear for retail investors to understand what they're dealing with, who they're dealing with, who the other token holders are, what price point they hold these tokens at, um, uh, and stuff. And, uh, and yeah, um, I, I'm very like anti-regulation generally, but I think simple stuff like this that lets people, I, I hate when regulators tell people what they are and aren't allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, like I don't like it if they say you're not allowed to release a stable coin, you're not allowed to build Luna. But I don't like that. People should be allowed to do whatever they want, but people should be informed uh, sufficiently. So you, retail investors should have the information available to them to make um, fair, good, well-informed decisions. I think um, rather than just saying you know you're not allowed to build that building that's illegal, you should have to declare. I'm building this, this is how it works. And people should understand how it works before they put their entire life savings into a savings account that issues 20% that's printing it out, out of thin air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much agree with, with everything you said. Like I'm not a big fan of kind of like most regulations myself, but it, it kind of like all, all goes back to the proactive versus reactive. And the SEC is really just being reactive, right? Like as you said, they only come in when something blows up instead of actually forcing uh, or not forcing or at least kind of like working with these teams to kind of like do these disclosures and, and things like that. And there's been a bit of kind of like stuff uh, happening within the crypto ecosystem on that front. Like Masari has their disclosures registry. You know, before CoinGecko was showing fully diluted uh, market caps, uh, coin market cap wasn't doing it when coin market cap was much more popular. So no one knew. Like you would see the supply of the yeah. coin and you would only see the circulating supply. You wouldn't see, and that wouldn't even be accurate. And you, you wouldn't ever see the fully diluted kind of like value and wouldn't see the, the max supply. So a lot of people would buy into something being like, oh, it's only, you know, such and such market cap. But in reality, if you take it, the kind of like rest of the supply into account, it was like much, much larger. So I think 
you know, we've tried to do it within the industry, but it, it just doesn't seem to be enough, right? Because I think that, you, I, I think it's, it's, it's enough to the extent of people that are already crypto native and aren't like totally new can like navigate these waters. And I've seen over the last 12 months, a lot of people that have been in the ecosystem for maybe a couple of years are much more kind of like sensitive to this stuff. And they, and they kind of like look at fully diluted market cap. They look at who's, who's kind of invested. They look at kind of like what the token emissions are like but you're right like the, the average retail investor especially newer ones they don't learn this at, at, at straight away they have to kind of like go through the pain to get to that point because there's no real kind of like i guess like authority telling them sort of, sort of thing so yeah i mean the sec like uh, i mean as much as i don't want them too involved in the ecosystem them just kind of like working with teams to disclose these things would add a lot of legitimacy to, to those sorts of things and get a lot more eyeballs on it i think as well so yeah i mean it's kind of like a, a hard thing as well because the regulatory agencies depending on how they approach it they tend to overstep sometimes so the worst case would be like the sec making it so cumbersome for these teams to report these things that the teams either would just like not report anything or are they getting trouble for like not being accurate and then it just again leads to them being like well why would i report anything if i'm just going to get in trouble for it like it's like how uniswap yeah. is so scared of the SEC that they're not going to enable the rev share on the uni token, right? Because the SEC hasn't given them any guidance, hasn't said, you know, what, you know, what, what, what what's going to happen if they do that. So they're just like, well, we're not going to do it. And that has resulted in the uni token being down only like, I mean, not, not the only reason, but like a major reason, I think. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of like things to think about around that, but I, I agree with you that just those like small touches, as you said, would, would be a huge boon to the industry. And I think, the small touches from inside the industry, like Masari and CoinGecko, have already made a very positive effect, but not for the newer people, more for the people who actually like have been around for a little bit, already got burnt, and then go looking and like, why did I get so burnt? Why did I get so dumped on? Like, yeah. why didn't I see this coming? Right. So yeah. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe even rather than the SEC, I think it would be good if it was self policed, like if exchanges um, forced themselves to or forced assets to um, like provide this information somewhere um, before listing or the exchange provided the information themselves. Like what is this asset? What are the like key investment like criteria you need to know? Um, mm -hmm. I think that, that like, I think that's much better than the SEC getting involved because I don't think they're a credible crypto regulator. I don't think they're a credible organization. I think they're doubling down on a strategy that they failed at. I think they haven't protected retail investors at all over the last 10 years of, um, of crypto. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so I, I think self-policing is, is much, much, much better, um, which is why I was kind of happy to see the Luna proposal of like uh, paying back small investors first. I don't know if it actually works economically. I, I just saw it in a tweet, but um, that was what happened with the Madoff um, scheme, uh, the mm -hmm. Bernie Madoff scheme. Like actually if small investors ended up mostly whole from that, I think, um, and only like the big whales that took the 30 odd percent haircut um, in being paid back. So I do think that um, like adopting those things before you're told to adopt those things um, is quite a good sign and um, hopefully will um, continue a lot, but we'll see. I, I wonder how you feel about um, like the, like in, in bull markets, I think it, to, especially towards the end, um, it's really easy to just lose all hope and faith of like the point of the ecosystem um, or the point of the industry. Um, and I wonder how you feel about, you know, uh, DeFi 2.0, which is like a lot of Ponzi nomics, like on top of a fork of DeFi 1. Um, a lot of the um, monkey picture type uh, uh excess in NFTs and, and the bubble uh, there. And the Shiba Inu, Doge, um, like meme coin uh, response to like the meme stock um, uh, bubble. Um, how do you find yourself remaining focused if like, that's all that happened the last couple, like last year or so is just stupidity. So did anything good happen apart from that? I mean, the, the way I kind of like stay focused is I just focus on like Ethereum. I mean, people call me an ETH maxi for it, but like the, I, I truly believe that the most interesting and non kind of like financial first things are happening within the Ethereum ecosystem and, and, and specifically at like the core protocol layer and like layer twos and things like that. Right. Like that's where I focus a lot of my time because it's just, 
it you, you barely hear about like the prices of things or like the financial kind of like aspect of it. It's all really about the technology. And, um, you know, I, I, that's why I kind of like focus my attention there. But I, I think what I, what I hated most about something like the dog coins was I didn't hate that people could trade them. And it was basically like trading a meme, right? I hated that big kind of like figures like Elon Musk gave legitimacy to these things. Like Dogecoin, for example, obviously is his pet kind of like project. Um, and kind of like he gave a lot of legitimacy to it. And he kind of basically got a lot of retail investors to to kind of like go into it and to kind of like buy into it at the top, especially as well. And then they're kind of completely wrecked on that, right? Um, and, and a lot of people actually believed that Dogecoin was going to be like the currency of the internet and was going to be like integrated with Twitter and, and all these sorts of stuff. And Elon Musk is still doing this, right? He's, it's not like he's learned his lesson or stopped. I mean, you know, I think Elon Musk is a very divisive character these days. And I think he definitely has a God complex. Um, he's just kind of like not a crypto native god complex right so people don't really make the make the kind of like connection but but i certainly do um but you know the funny thing about like something like dogecoin as well though is like vitalik also lends it legitimacy like he's all but he's been talking about it forever and i don't think he he tries to lend legitimacy because he's trying to pump up the price or anything like that um he he's just interested in kind of like dogecoin as a thing right like it's it's, it's kind of like a, a an intellectual kind of like interest for him but at the same time like to be fair I kind of like sometimes see that I'm just like, mm, is this really the best kind of like thing Vitalik could be doing? Like, yes, he's intellectually interested in it, but is it lending this thing too much legitimacy? And is it going to lead, lead to people kind of like getting hurt, which it probably does. Like people look up to, to Vitalik and think, you know, wow, okay, if he's interested in this, then it must be legit. Um, but, you know, he'll obviously never tell anyone to, to buy it or, to, you know, he'll never like sell you to someone. That this is more than what it is, right? He, he knows it's a mean, fun currency and, and that's it. But, you know, Elon Musk doesn't say that. He kind of like says, oh, we can improve Dogecoin. We can make it the, you know, the currency of this. We can integrate it with Twitter. We can do tipping, blah, 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 right? Um, but and then then the, then you had the derivatives. You had the, the SHIB uh, kind of like pump, and then you had all the other dog tokens that just kind of like fall off of that, which we see with everything. It's like that euthanasia roller coaster, right? Like something gets really big, and then you have it kind of like spirals out of control from the forks. And that's nothing new. I mean, it goes back to the early Bitcoin days where people would just create forks, and then it would just kind of like spiral out the same way. So I think that I'm fine with people trading these things. But going back to what we were just talking about, as long as they know what they're trading and as long as they know what kind of like it is it's it's a meme it's like literally i mean i wouldn't even call it trading at that point i'd call it gambling because it's it's really gambling on other people wanting to kind of like come in and buy your bags off you essentially which i mean you can argue that from any investment but when there's something doesn't really have any fundamentals behind it it's, it's easier to kind of like argue about um and i guess like the DeFi 2.0 stuff I, I mean i've been saying for a while that DeFi 2.0 was just a term used to mask ponzi's uh, at the end of the day like it was just trying to let them kind of like take a legitimate term known as DeFi and apply it to something that is pretty much illegitimate right in, in terms of kind of like there's not really much innovation going on there. there there's a couple of things that fell out of it but the biggest DeFi 2.0 projects are completely dead now right like the frog nation behind daniel sesta like everyone loved that like oh this is DeFi 2.0 this is awesome but like it was all a massive kind of like ponzi that re required like all this money to come in or else it would collapse and it did collapse like we saw it collapse and and um i, I think same is true for for a lot of different projects there so i i didn't like that term i think i thought it was just like a very heavy marketing term i actually actually think that the DeFi, the, the projects known as DeFi 1.0 is where the innovation is happening. Like there's a lot of work going on there, but people don't pay attention to it because these projects are actually legitimate. They don't use Ponzi-esque mechanisms to grow themselves and attract all that attention and capital. And they don't have shill armies. Like you don't see a, like an MKR army or a uni army, right? Like you would see like a lunar army or a kind of like frog nation, for example, right? And that's because, the, and, and you've written about this before, about kind of like the attention game and the meta game, you know, with attention being scarce and things like that. That's what it's all about too. It's like people aren't really paying attention to kind of like these legitimate projects because they're boring at the end of the day. Like, yes, they're doing a lot of cool innovations, but it's only cool to people who care about the technology side. If you only care about making money, which is what pretty much all retail investors, especially the ones that come into this industry as like a first cycle care about, then they're going to be paying attention to the things that are making them money. And in a bull market, these things work really, really well, right? I mean, we've seen this time and time again through all the cycles. You've been through it more than I have, but it's the same story every single time. So I, I just, I really hated that that kind of like DeFi 2.0 term because of that. And I, and I think that I don't see many people throwing it around these days, which is nice. And I think more people, especially in the wake of the Terra collapse, are realizing the importance of security and decentralization and kind of like moving slower on these things and actually being boring for kind of like long-term health instead of just being exciting for three months and then collapsing. Like that's all well and yeah. good if, it's, if you view it as a gamble. But if you're viewing it as an actual long-term investment, which I think a lot of people do, 
They, they kind of like take the three months of the end of the bull market and say, well, this is the way things are always going to be. And they, they wrongly assume that. And then they get just fleeced. I mean, even like everything is down like 90 plus percent other than kind of like BTC and ETH at this point against USD. And then even more against that. And these people, they get they get burnt and they just think crypto is a scam and they they leave. And that's why we have those bull bear cycles that are so violent because we just wreck everyone when we have anyone coming into this ecosystem. We just send them straight to the slaughterhouse instead of actually onboarding them into like the legitimate things. But at the same time, it's kind of like uh, the, the incentives. Like people are going to go to where they can make money as a first cycler or where they think they can make money rather than to the to the projects that may, maybe me, you and I find interesting that are not making as much money and are kind of like boring as well. So I mean, I don't blame people. Like I don't blame the individual. I blame the structure of this whole ecosystem and how kind of like the incentives are just all just out of whack, especially during kind of like the bull markets. Yeah, I think DeFi 2.0 was maybe a little bit like we were saying, it's like blending in with DeFi 1 because the products are kind of similar, but then they also end up as like a game of chicken, uh, an investment game of chicken where everyone piles into the thing that's moving. It's late cycle. So everyone's capital floods into the same thing. They get really overvalued. Um, you know, I, I think Danny Danny's project Spell, mm-hmm. MIM or whatever, I yeah. think it's held up pretty well like it there was a lot of fun about it breaking peg for a while it didn't um i think it still operates and um it's still fine um it just topped at the same time as the actual macro bull market top um so it got a there mega was wonderland nuked. though as well right the that collapsed pretty spectacularly that was the own fork yeah, yeah the yeah, own fork went below yeah down yeah. below the net asset value. But even yeah. OMFOX trading above net asset value is a sign of froth, right? Like it, like there isn't tons of additional value. It, it, you can even argue they should often trade below because you can't actually claim the, the assets um, underlying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he has done a decent enough job of like reconsolidating all of those um, projects and he's still working on them. And I, I think the Sifu stuff was like maybe bad judgment, but um, <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't help. Um, didn't help. But um, yeah, I mean, like there, there were a couple of maybe things that came out of DeFi 2.0 and, and the fact, if anything good came out of it, that's like net positive. But I do think it became one of those um, everyone on the train type vehicles and then people, um, people buy the top of it and it's just hugely overvalued because it is the current like narrative and, um, uh, and, and trend. Um, and I think a few of these like DeFi 2.0 projects will um, probably survive over the long term, and most of them won't. The same way DeFi 1 projects, a lot of them have uh, fallen by the wayside. Some have really stuck around because they were fundamentally important and some were trendy or got replaced by, didn't have um, didn't have a moat, got replaced by better or more efficient protocols and um, and stuff. And I think that's normal and healthy. Um, I guess one one comparison is like a lot of these things operate like really early stage startups. Mm-hmm. So you have these protocols that are worth a billion dollars or something a year or so ago, or maybe two years ago even. And they're basically a startup, right? It's the success is not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. They get valued because it's a hot sector. Um, and there are a lot of people using them. Um, but then they just lose their position in the industry because um, a bigger protocol copies their product and uh, then you know you don't want to use it anymore. Like Compound was bigger than Arv for ages and then Arv just like kept shipping and outperformed them and is now bigger than and Compound, I think. Um, and you, you have that happen quite a lot in the industry. But normally with startups... They're not liquid, so they don't have retail investors speculating on them. Um, uh, and when they fail, the people that lose money are the private VCs who cannot sell because there's no acquisition, they're not going public, it just winds up and it's over. Um, so that's why I think retail investors in crypto get wrecked a lot more is because they see something working briefly. And I've made a more real-world startup investments than I have crypto startup investments. And I've seen things working briefly where there is a moment of magic and then they can't turn it into a product. They can't turn it into a business long-term. They can't um, capitalize on that relationship properly. Um, And that happens in crypto all the time too. And figuring out when something is hot or when something is like sustainable and long-term as a product, I think is very hard because they look the same at the time and people get excited about them and they develop cults as well. Mm -hmm. Um, The interesting thing with the cults is like, Sometimes legitimate projects have them too. Like Chainlink has a really big one, mm-hmm. um, which is 
out of the ordinary because um, a lot of the really, really, really big cults, I think, uh, often mark the top and like the asset goes to obscurity. But Chainlink, it feels like the importance of the like project and technology is detached from token price. Maybe that just happens to every crypto project. Like the tokens are just like trending down to their real valuations um, mm -hmm. and not attached to like real world metrics for them or something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you're right. And I think the, the problem, as you said, like the problem is that liquidity is like there for these things, like much sooner than it is there for like a non-crypto startup, right? Like it's on average, I think seven years to IPO for, for like non-crypto startups. Right. Whereas in crypto, it's like a year or less, like yeah, probably yeah, like yeah. even, even less than that. Right. So you, you don't have a product. And a lot of these tokens, as you said, like go live without like even a product yet. They, they kind of tease that there's a product coming, but they're like, Oh, we'll put our token out there first. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like what, what's the, what's the worth of the token? Like the, it's, just a future kind of like worth this and and like the chance of this failing is really high like in the normal kind of like world it's like 90 percent in within five years of, of kind of like startups fail i think within crypto it's a higher percentage because there's just so much kind of like uh things that, yeah. that kind of like happen but yeah as you said like there's a brief period during a bull market where the token price will go up with everything else because it's just like a liquidity kind of like um injection but then, and people, and then, and then, especially because of liquidity mining, people will be like, "Oh, look at all the TVL in this protocol," because uh, you know, uh, kind of like it's billions of dollars. This protocol is doing so amazingly. I'm just going to buy the token. When in reality, it's because they're buying the token and because the token price is going up that the yeah. TVL is going up. And yeah. a lot of people that are new will not make that connection. And, and that's why I think a lot of the tokens end up going down only is because they get to these stupid valuations based on nothing. And then the projects over the long term will just kind of like fade into irrelevancy and just fail to ever reach their bull market highs. And, and then people move on to the next thing. So I think, yeah, it's, it's very dangerous. And I, and, and I think there are some kind of like projects in this ecosystem that have held off on doing a token for a very long time. I think the layer twos fall into that bucket. They're like, you know, let's not do a token until we've actually got like a product out there. We've actually got people using it. We've actually got a reason to do a token, but that's not the rule. That's the exception. The rule is put a token out there, get like some kind of like people involved because they've bought into the token and then worry about shipping the product later. And nine times out of 10 or 9.5 times out of 10 that leads in ruin for like pretty much everyone. And, and uh, it's kind of like really sad that that happens because there are actually some good projects that if they just didn't have a token and they just kind of tried to grow organically may have actually succeeded. Uh, and because the token was a detriment to the, to their project uh, by, by launching it too early. So, um, but you, you could argue it yeah, either that way. Is, but that I, is interesting. Yeah. Mm. It is interesting because a lot of people were launching tokens defensively, right? They were like, like even Uniswap was potentially even a defensive token launch because Sushi was vampire attacking them. Um, so they launched them with this like, okay, it's like kind of defensive growth mechanism where if we don't have one, someone else will just clone our work and have one um, and they'll get all our growth because they'll be paid to go there instead, but the product will be the same because it's open source. Mm -hmm. And now that token model works in the opposite way where, yeah, it brought in a lot of people. It was a good growth mechanic but it's unwinding because now the chart is only going down and people are less interested in that token. So maybe they're even less interested in that product. And you have some products like Matcha, um, the XYZ or whatever it is, um, that haven't launched a, a token and have said mm -hmm. they probably won't ever do one, I think. Um, and personally, I, go, I always use that now because I'm like, oh yeah, don't like one inch. They're like, you know, they're cunts and, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, so on, so on. Um, and you're definitely not using Paraswap. Like they, yeah. they did the airdrop for only 10 people or some shit. I always yeah. use Matcha. And it, it reminds me a little bit of when Uniswap launched and Uniswap was Bancor without a token. <laughs> it's like, wait, we're just in a, in a bear market. We just like the products without tokens. And in a bull market, we like love tokens. All right. Yeah. But um, the products that projects and protocols that did the method you spoke of, which was launch the token after the product. Um, I think like isomorphically, or the, the, if you categorize them, they often fit into these longer term um, focused, more like uh, less hyped projects. It's like mm -hmm. Arbitrum is very hyped. I'm sure they'll do a token some point this year or next year or whenever. Um, but it's very hyped because it's layer two scaling and people you know, want Ethereum to scale better. Um, but it's not hyped in the same way like DeFi 2.0 was and like a lot of these token projects are, are hyped. Um, and they do in the product first method and because they're a, 
um, they think it's important to be around for a very long time and that's the the most sustainable way so mm. like categorically a lot of those project products um that do that end up in this similar category in my mind where it's like they'll be around for a very long time they'll be important parts of the ecosystem or DeFi for ages um but also i observe that none of their price actions ever very good it never mm-hmm. goes like insanely up you never get a huge uh win out of them they always open um much closer to their like realistic valuations um uniswap did a decent pump but it was uh it was launched right at the very beginning of the the bull market so um it just went up like kind of at market average uh with everything mm-hmm. um so it, so it is interesting like those ones are like the legitimate ones but you the speculators don't have much room within them to get what they really want out of the like gambling a uh, game of chicken type investing. Um so it's interesting. How do you feel about um uh like token project team members like av av team members or whatever selling their tokens when should it be allowed? That's a tough one. <laughs> Cuz they all have like their own vesting right attached to it. Um and like yeah. some people would argue well if, if that's the vesting schedule then they should be allowed to sell as soon as they've got like vested out tokens, right? And I, I get that argument. But you know, and some people will view it as well why are these people selling? Do they, have they lost kind of like faith in the project? Have they have, are they kind of like bearish on it? I don't think that's that's necessarily true because it's kind of like, well, these people join, maybe they joined the team really early on, right? And they were promised equity as part of their package and their salary maybe wasn't great because it was a startup. Um, and they're just like, well, you know, this is a huge win for me. Like I made my 100x on my equity rather than my 100x on on something else in the public markets. So why shouldn't they be allowed to, to sell, right? Like if, if you make 100x on something on the public market, no one's questioning you for selling that. So just, be, well, just because these people, you know, got it um, as for being part of the team, like they've added more value than you have like if you buy a token on on public markets and it goes 100x you've added like basically not no value to that maybe you added some marginal value because you made the price go up a little in a little bit by buying but you know the people who actually were part of the team building the thing and driving the most value then in my mind they should be able to to sell whenever they want like the vesting schedule is 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 made by the the kind of like executive team or whatever of the of the startup so they should be able to sell but in saying that if the vesting is like really bad where it's kind of like as soon as a token launches everyone gets their tokens like on day one well i mean that's just going to lend itself to people selling right like especially if it's a hyped up token launch and you know if the fully diluted value gets like way ahead of the actual kind of like circulating value um, or kind of like the float uh, value, then, you know, that can, it can seem a little bit kind of like scammy where it's just like, well, did the team just vest out themselves so they could sell because they knew that it would go, like it was so hyped and the value would skyrocket and then it would kind of like bleed out, which is, there's been a bunch of those for sure. Um, but I think for the generally legitimate projects where team members have been there for like potentially years, they're getting their kind of like package, like you would like when something IPOs, you're getting your kind of tokens or whatever vested out, then I don't think there's a problem selling. And I don't think that means that they're bearish on anything. I think it just means that they're, hey, this money can actually improve my life. Maybe they want to go buy themselves a house or maybe they've been living frugally because they were at a startup where their salary you know, wasn't very good. I don't blame them for that at all. And I, I, you can argue it either way, but I think the argument that they're not allowed to sell because it's bearish is kind of like a really weak one for, 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 for a lot of projects, especially for team members that have been there for a while. On the other hand, if there's a team member that joined like a month ago and they're getting tokens, like, cause the, 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 the thing I uh, kind of like tokenized and they're selling straight away. I mean, it's kind of like, it can look a bit, bit shady and a bit grifty, but you would, you would kind of like expect the actual team, the actual kind of like uh, CEO or the founders to see that and kind of like be like, well, you know, if you're just kind of like here for money, then we're going to cut you off. Cause there's a lot of clauses that say, you know, we can cut you off at any time. You're not guaranteed to get these things. Like, it, just because it's vesting out to you doesn't mean that it's going to be set in stone. We can actually change this. We can fire you, so to speak, anything like that. So there's a lot of that going on. But generally, I don't think we should shame pe- the team members for selling their kind of like tokens and, and kind of like, you know, improving their lives from the work that they did and contributed to a project, right? Yeah, I'm very, very, I, I've been thinking a lot recently about like milestone based vesting for team members. Mm-hmm. Because like, if, you know, Curve's been out two years, right? Also, um, mm-hmm. and Curve is clearly an extremely important part of the ecosystem. It's fulfilled its role. It's permanently got the number one TVL, uh, like super high volume. Um, and there'll be people vesting for four years on uh, on the on the Curve side, so they have to wait uh, another two years. Um, 
So they were not even really able to realize the peak of um, what they created, right? They built something. It went absolutely insane, um, like a really crazy product in the times of peak bull market. And if we enter a bear market now that lasts for a couple of years, they'll fully vest at the bottom of the bear market. And that, mm -hmm. like, that kind of sucks for them. Um, but it, like what they built was very, very, very important for a period of time. Um, and Curve having accelerated vesting from milestones makes sense to me because they've built something that is actually practically important. Um, so they're not just dumping tokens of some vapor. They um, should be allowed to realize some of their net worth, which is illiquid, to liquid in order to de-risk working on it forever. I think founders should be able to... Um, de-risk that net worth number that fluctuates, which can be distracting, which can be, um, you know, it can drive you insane if you watch it go up and down and you can't do anything about it. Um, they should be able to sell it, buy the house, be very solid, have a money in the bank so they feel good forever. And that gives them the comfort blanket to go for the home run. Like I'm going to build curve into the fucking biggest thing that's ever existed because no matter what, I've got my house and stuff. Um, and so I, I'm supportive of um, I'm supportive of founders selling um, in order to like go big. What I get confused about is when you have like you know the Maps token. It was like mm -hmm. Maps.me, and it's like yeah. the tokens for like a, a DeFi wallet Maps app thing, um, and it's got like an FTX perp that goes down only, and it was worth <laughs> a billion dollars at some point or something. And like their vesting will complete. And they'll they'll be able to sell, but they haven't hit any milestones or like, you know, the DeFi wallet. Is that like a popular part of DeFi now? Like is maps like fundamentally important to the ecosystem? So they'll just be able to dump tokens as they vest on a time basis, which, um, you know, maybe like as and when Curve are able to, to sell, even though um, the valuation is probably reasonably similar and they haven't built anything that's like that important to the ecosystem. So I... I struggle a little bit with like when it should be okay for team members to sell because I do think that team and founders should be able to de-risk and it actually makes them build better and more aggressively if they're not trying to just maintain a, a valuation for two or three years. Like it allows them to take really risky, um, ambitious steps to go 10x upwards instead of just going, oh, let's just sit here and try and maintain market share and don't do anything mm -hmm. wrong because I want to keep this number here so I can buy a house. Um, I don't think they should be allowed to dump on public markets. I think like these places should uh, have like secondary rounds with big funds that lock, um, that honor the original lock or uh, ex even extend locks um, in cases like that. But I think it should all be milestone based. Like if you create a DeFi project today um, and you have a team, you have a normal vesting schedule for them and you have accelerated vesting based on um, milestones and that accelerated vesting just kind of says you can participate X amount in a secondary sale if we can find someone to fund it um, if we hit these milestones in this time. I think something like that would be much healthier for the ecosystem. So like people are not just unlocking huge bags all at once, selling on public markets, other team members not selling on public markets because they don't want to be the one that dumps and then, you know, mm -hmm. causing infighting. Um, but I, like a lot of these projects where they don't build anything, I like, maybe they should get extended vesting. Who knows, man? I don't know. All right. So we, at the beginning, we promised people that you were going to, you know, release some of your Anon account takes. So we've got to end with Sasal's spiciest. I was going to try and alliterate the whole thing, but I don't know. So just like your spiciest takes, what would you say? when you were drunk that you maybe wouldn't say it's, it's, it's mate, it's the daily Gway. No one watches. So you, no, one's, no one's going to hear it. No one's going to hear what you say. You're not going to get in any trouble. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think this might be the, actually the, the one episode that does get viewed because you're on it. So, um, <laughs> uh, I think I, I don't want to, I can give you, yeah, I'll give you some spicy takes, but, uh, maybe not the spiciest, not the stuff that I would say that like, if there was no one listening, um, I think as I alluded to at the start, like I want there to be more accountability um, and not just accountability from the community in this ecosystem. I, I want some people to actually face legal repercussions for the things that they do in this ecosystem. I want the actual scammers to end up in prison. Um, if I'm being honest, I want examples to be set 
because I don't think that if if that doesn't I think if that doesn't happen, we're just going to keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Because people come in and they say, okay, well, there's this scam and this scam and this scam, and nothing's happened to them. Why would I not scam as well, right? It's just kind of like a merry band of scammers. And I think it's it's, it's with in the kind of like outside of the crypto ecosystem, if there was no law against doing like certain things, like if there was no law against theft people would just steal anything, right? They're, they're literally like, a lot of people think that people don't steal because it's like just a morally kind of like wrong thing to do. No, I mean, a lot of people don't steal because they, they know that okay, they'll get potentially caught and they'll end up in jail. So there's always that threat, that looming threat there of kind of like enforcement. But we don't have that in crypto. Like even um, some of the biggest kind of like grifts in this ecosystem, I, I struggle to call it a scam, but like the EOS ICO, for example, right? the year long EOS ICO that went nowhere, that Block One did. EOS is obviously a dead project, but Block One converted all of that ETH into BTC. And now they're one of the biggest BTC holders. The SEC slaps them with a $24 million fine, which is fucking nothing compared to what they made. And they run away you know, with their, with their riches intact, right? Uh, you know, Brock Pierce runs away to Puerto Rico and he gets to enjoy his life after having drained all this money, right? So if, 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 if there's no enforcement at all, like it's just going to keep happening. And it, what's even sadder is that you mentioned the Ripple case with the SEC. I actually think that Ripple is going to win that case uh, because they have unlimited money to spend on lawyers to start with, right? Like they have so much money from ill-gotten gains to spend on lawyers. But also I kind of like want them to win it because of the fact that the SEC to me is such an illegitimate organization that if they can't classify XRP as a security, then good luck with anything else. But, you know, the security stuff is a, is a different ballgame. I actually think the actual proven scam is the people who that you can prove in a court of law actually scammed people need to end up in, in prison to set an example, uh, because otherwise we're just going to keep repeating the same stuff. And that might be an aggressive take, but look, we don't tolerate scammers a lot of the time in the traditional world, right? Like there are some enforcement there, but at the same time, there isn't. Like there's a lot of grifters, like a lot of grifters in the, in the kind of like outside of crypto that, that you know, self-help gurus who sell hopium, like just like people sell hopium in crypto. But if there's like a verifiable scam that like everyone pretty much agrees is a scam, except maybe the people who got scammed <laughs> or the people who kind of like are still in the scam, then there should be kind of like some enforcement and should be jail time, like actual jail time for, for these people to dissuade future scammers. Um, and like, I guess that might be one of the spiciest stakes I can come up with like on the, on the spot, but I also, I, think I liked that, a bit where you were like, uh, you like, Oh, I, I'd steal everything. If I wasn't going to get caught, I'm looking <laughs> no. at your room now. I'm like, is all this, <laughs> this, this ill gotten gains? Is this all theft? <laughs> You're running into stores and running away. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, uh, I wasn't talking about me personally, of course, like none of this is me personally, but uh, no, I just think generally people are, are a bit naive to think that the people don't do bad things because it's just like not morally right to do bad things rather than there's a law against it because in lawless places, people will do bad things. Right. And they'll, they'll do them because they know they can get away with it. So I think that is what's happened in crypto for the longest time. Now people know that they can get away with it. So they just do it. They just say, fuck it. Who cares? Like, I'm not going to go to jail. I'll just make all this money and I'll just exit and no one will care because everyone forgets because within a day, everyone forgets. Like there's, there's no, people make memes about it. Like Do Kwon, what people remember about Do Kwon is the memes, like he's, he's shit posting on Twitter. Um, and same with like BitConnect, right? What, what do everyone, what does everyone remember about BitConnect? The Carlos, whatever his name is on stage. Yeah, doing his singing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So no yeah. one ever remembers the, the bad bits. They just remember the memes. So I, I, yeah, I just that, that's probably one of the spiciest things I can come up with. That people need to go to jail for this stuff to stop. Otherwise, it's just going to keep continuing. Yeah. So my, my take was going to be that a lot of these people, uh, uh, especially the VCs, I think, they're not fraudsters. They're just stupid. Like, <laughs> I, think, like I think some, like, you know, there are a lot of obviously like scam projects and um, I think EOS of, of quite literally like obfuscated where which entity the money belongs to and now they're doing this bullish exchange and I think they're you know trying to make sure that that money stays in, intact in their control uh, or you know to build it into more money and it's definitely not being invested into the EOS blockchain right <laughs> um, so I think there's deliberate steps taken there but I do think a lot of the VCs um, are extremely dumb i think they're not smart i don't think they can think critically i don't think they can evaluate one project from the other i think they rely on social signaling like who's in this round or like paradigms in the round that means it must be good how much can i get um and um they just see like 
I can buy 66% discount, 66% discount, good. That means token can go down 66% and I can still break even. <laughs> Will it go down 66% in one year? Hmm, that's quite a lot. Probably not. Buy. You know, that I think that is how they think these things through. Mm -hmm. And then instead of it being like malicious, I think that they go on Twitter and go, I like this thing that I own. <laughs> like, I yeah. think they're just dumb and like they don't really get it. And I think that there's like specific people in my mind that I can, and I can think of. Um, and you can tell because they haven't really done anything prior to like this fund, this VC, they like, you know, it's not like they had a reasonably successful career building something or mm -hmm. contributed to like, you know, jobs that have a high bar to get those jobs or um, whatever. And I'm not into credentialism. Um, I'm just saying it, there is a trend where if the first thing that they've done that's had any success was um, to fund like inside a guaranteed win projects, um, they might not be super smart. They might not be like, you know, excellent critical thinking individuals who are seeing the future, they might just be along for the ride on uh, Euphoria. I don't think they understand how most of their projects work. I don't think mm -hmm. they've ever used them. Um, and um, uh, I think it, it, there's a concept um, uh, in, I think it's mostly in Germany, of a rat tail, which is a bunch of rats, they get their tails tied together and then they die and you find like um, all these rats spread out with their tails tied in one. Normally it's like hair or like, I don't know, gonk or something that gets, or sometimes they just get tied together. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to end up looking a little bit like that when they realize they were following someone who was following someone who was following someone who was following the original person mm -hmm. and none of them actually know what they're talking about. None of them do <laughs> due diligence. They don't think critically and 99% of stuff is going to zero. Um, because they funded trash. Mm. Um, so I, I don't think they're all egomaniacs. I think there's definitely some e egomaniac founders that these people can follow and, um, and riff off. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of the VCs are actually just extremely dumb and they mm -hmm. have been caught up in the like, I've got following people like me, I'm a genius, I'm making money um, yeah. type thing. Um, and I think the actual people who are malicious are, um, a need to be smart to be malicious um and i think they're less frequent they definitely still exist though all right dude mm -hmm. that was fun i gotta go yeah. looking forward to future sasal spicy takes yeah yeah no thanks for thanks for uh, the chat man this was good uh i'll see you later yeah peace dude